Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, indeed a pleasure uh, to host this uh, rather interesting panel uh, in front of this illustrious gathering today in New Delhi. We have the who's who from family businesses of uh, India Inc. And we look forward to some enriching thoughts from our panelists. Key trends in succession planning and family offices. Now, that's quite a gaguntua and subject, right? But we're going to try and glean the very best that we can from our panel of experts over here. And we're going to try and keep it sharp, focused, and make it as useful for you as possible. So without uh, any uh, further uh, processes, let's go ahead and let's quickly uh, kickstart. Uh, Swamia, opening words to you. Uh, Beaton being passed right now, if you look at this trend, in the past few years, we've seen the Beaton being passed more and more to women in family businesses. And that's something that is uh, diametrically opposite to uh, what was happening earlier, where on most of the occasions, the beaten was being passed uh, to the males in business families. What do you think has uh, contributed to this trend in recent times? Could you throw some light on that? Um, so as I shared in my earlier speech, we're seeing increasingly more women come into family businesses. And I think some of the reasons for that is, first and foremost, is just the fact that they are qualified to come into the family business. So earlier, uh, potentially in terms of their own qualifications, being educated to take up roles in leadership in uh, family businesses, perhaps that was skewed a little bit more towards um, the sons rather than the daughters. That has changed in the last, uh, I think, the last generation. So we see many more coming in really as qualified professionals on the f in the first instance. The second is that you then also have a much wider talent pool in order to find successors. Because if they are qualified, then, and if, particularly where a family business is concerned, um, if you just have more people who are competent to come into the business and they can serve that purpose, then you'd like to actually see them in the business itself. Um, so I think these two are fairly important reasons why we're seeing more women. And of course, I think societal, uh, there's a societal change. Uh, which is there, which is not about necessarily passing them down the business just to the male heirs, but really in terms of can also women step into leadership roles. And the numbers do have it in terms of 38% in leadership roles today, and that's only increasing. So the more global they become, um, I think uh, their expertise will be very useful for right. businesses. Right, kudos. Hope this trend accelerates in the days to come. We've also got a legal and advisory viewpoint uh, on the panel today. Uh, Pallavi, uh, over to you. Would you like to add to what uh, Samia has said as far as the emergence of women as business leaders is concerned in recent times? I think Samia made a very valid comment that, you know, uh, nobody shies from educating the women, uh, the girls in the family. So there's no reason why, you know, they shouldn't have a shot at running the family business. Uh, another interesting trend is in a lot of businesses you'll find it's, uh, they only have daughters. So, you know, there isn't much to choose from. And the women have really stepped up. So, you know, uh, Anna, there are so many examples. We have a couple of them sitting right here in the audience, uh, you know, where they've chosen to join the family business and doing a great job. So I think it's, a, it's multiple things. It's, it's the fact that there's a lot more awareness, there's a lot more education. And women have proved themselves, which I think only paves the way for more women to come. You know, you also sometimes need uh, the right examples to champion for people to know that, yes, this is something we can step up and do and for everybody to accept it. Absolutely, we have a few torch bearers, like you said, in the audience. Absolutely, yeah. and it's happened in great measure, and uh, a lot of women have been absolute trailblazers who've paved the way for a lot of other women to come in and step in on the business. Right, quickly shifting focus to the subject of family offices. Now, as you're aware, last year, the government had ushered in a new regime, overseas investment regime. And many believe that that perhaps opened the floodgates for Indian family offices to perhaps set up shop abroad. Now, if you look at it, if you compare India and some of the overseas family uh, offices, India isn't as geographically diversified as perhaps some of the overseas family offices in terms of presence. So uh, you're the legal eagle on the panel today, Rishabh. Uh, what's been the response so far from India uh, to the overseas investment regime? Uh, I know the RBI of late uh, is sort of frowning upon it, so if you could uh, throw some light on that. Sure, let me just add maybe one quick comment on what the two very smart women before me also said. 
I think I would also congratulate both the fathers and the father-in-laws and the whole kind of women coming into leadership roles as well. For women to succeed, there also has to be an acceptance on the other side where somebody is conceding space or somebody is actually making space for women to come up and prosper. So I would congratulate both the fathers and the father-in-laws in the audience as well for, for, from that angle. I think on your question on family offices, especially overseas diversification, it has been wholeheartedly and fully, I think, uh, welcomed by Indian families today. Uh, no matter how diverse your portfolio in India is, you're still exposed to an India risk. So I think we're seeing more and more families looking overseas to have more or less an India hedge. And which jurisdictions are they aiming at? In um, order of preference, I would definitely say Dubai, followed by Singapore, and now the new kid on the block is Gift City. So that's also really up and coming. And any reasons why these jurisdictions are finding favor with the current lot of uh, family folks looking to set up shop abroad? Sure, I think the they ecosystem is pretty conducive, I think, to Indian families uh, really setting up base over there. We are seeing them very welcoming to Indian money, Indian capital. They have a good ecosystem of advisors there who are kind of savvy with the Indian ecosystem as well. I think Dubai more than others really has upped this game and really making it easier to open structures to have the, uh, sort of have a sophisticated uh, ecosystem built around you. They are more welcoming of Indian money compared to Chinese money compared to Singapore. So I think between the two, I think if you asked me the question a year ago, I would say Singapore is winning. But today it's head and shoulders above Dubai is winning the whole overseas family office fight. All right. You heard it, audience. Dubai is the destination to go if any of you are planning to set up shop abroad as, as far as the family offices is concerned. Soumya, you know, uh, what about the regulators' uh, viewpoint on this? Right now, recently uh, there were a few press reports which said that perhaps the regulator isn't exactly that enthusiastic about the overseas investment regime and investment in financial services being used by certain uh, family business to set up shop abroad. What do you think could be the concern of the regulator, and what are your clients saying? Um, I think clearly you've got to be on the right side of the law. So whatever you do, it has to be regulatory correct. One interesting um, new space that they introduced recently in Kip City was the Family Investment Fund, uh, where they were allowing for clients to actually have exposure overseas. Uh, so really to, in some sense, uh, diversify your investment portfolio. Uh, that's still in the very nascent stages. We are yet to see a Family Investment Fund approved. But the fact that there was such a regulation which was even put in place seems to suggest that there is a little bit of uh, um, uh, just an ability to allow families to look at diversifying their investment portfolios. So I think in that sense, that's a step in the right direction. I don't know if Krishna would like to yeah, add I think a few that comments. that's more or less uh, what I would say. I think the problem is India has this Hotel California syndrome. Once in Indian business, is very hard to go outside India. So which is why when the small opening came in the system in the new ODI guidelines to take money outside, there was a huge flood of money which sort of took that route and went out. I think the government or the RBI maybe woke up a little too late in this situation and said, let's get some of it back or at least you know, slow the flood. So I think that's what the policy thinking now is Now we've today. answered my question. <laughs> Right, Pallavi, uh, I who think in your... Just to yeah. add to that, I think it's also to encourage the Family Investment Fund in Give City. Uh, you know, Give City has been around for a while and needed a bit of a push. And I think that's one reason why the point that you mentioned about authorized dealers being informally told not to yes. allow money, I think is also to push people to go towards Give City because if diversification of wealth is what you need to do, a family investment fund allows you to do that. You don't necessarily need to have a, a company overseas to do that. You can do it out of an FIF, which for FEMA reasons is overseas jurisdiction. So, you know, I was in fact coming to the whole Gift City point. So who among your client list is ready to make the debut? What's the response so far? And, and, and what are some of the issues or aspects that perhaps uh, maybe the government needs to uh, address or look at to make the entire process a little more streamlined and friendlier? So I think Soumya mentioned that there haven't been any approvals yet. Uh, and I think that's a little telling. Uh, the scheme is fabulous. Okay. You know, it essentially uh, allows any family, not just individuals, but even companies controlled by the family, to invest up $10 million over a three-year period and set up a fund which is open-ended, self-regulated uh, in the sense they can choose on their own how they want to make the investments. The interesting part of an FIF is it also in allows you to invest in physical assets, something that's never been seen before. And I think that's where the, the hitch is. Uh, I think the regulators want more clarity because otherwise we'll have people buying real estate. 
uh, which is something that the RBI has always been a little hawkish about in the sense uh, Indians buying property abroad. So I think it's just a matter of time. I think it's a great route. Uh, there's a tax uh, you know, benefit that's available. Uh, it's, it's something I think just a matter of time. As soon as I think a couple of applications get cleared, right. we need, just we pave need, the way for a, a lot more. Law. Yeah, yeah. In right. fact, a lot of people are waiting and watching to see what happens. Right. Let's see whether some of them get off talk. Uh, Risha, so you know we spoke about this earlier, right? About the entire sanctity of family business constitutions, correct? Um, and uh, do you get this feeling that they're perhaps being ignored in bad times? and perhaps being only relied upon in good times. It's, it's, it's quite a tricky uh, sort of aspect. And also, I would like to ask you, uh, you know, since you're a lawyer, can you get perhaps certain effective governance structures in place that ensure the sanctity of a family business constitution, perhaps an investment committee, perhaps an investment uh -huh. board? Loaded question, but go for it. So I would say when I was a very young and naive lawyer, maybe not that long ago, actually, that uh, had this idea that FCs were like a magic bullet that every family which had it would kind of last a thousand years and there was no way families would dispute if they had a family constitution or no way they would sort of have, they would have proper way to resolve conflicts and things like that. But after, you know, seeing, you know, the many large, you know, India's iconic families really landing up in court and at the heart of the dispute actually being a family constitution, I may perhaps wrongly or rightly be a bit jaded about how I see FCs and their really, um, Long term viability okay, today. Okay, don't take any names, but give us an example. Give us a case study. Some anecdote you from your just, experience so uh, far. Google family dispute today, you will get, you know, in the last two years, it says some of the largest Indian families sort of gone to court, and some of them are very hostile and contentious as well. And in every single case, there's been a lawyer drafted family constitution, binding, etc., etc. And it was made at a time when the families worked on certain assumptions about successor will be so and so, the economic business will grow and so and so, and you know, almost 10, 15 years later after the document was signed, assumptions have changed, people have changed, emotions have changed, etc. So the family in place today doesn't agree with what the family did 10, 15 years ago. So that's so landing is, so up So is that a blueprint that you have to perhaps ensure that these family business constitutions keep pace with time, you know? Not a blueprint, but I would say the reason why many of these fail is that after you sign the document, it goes into a drawer never to be opened again. So every single case we've seen that nobody really has followed up on the good intentions and spirits when the document was signed. Having really living the family constitution, living the principles, you know, enforcing a conflict mechanism, etc. So I think until you live your document, live your FC, I think it's sort of doomed to failure from day one. Right, Somia is beaming. Somia, vain. Just in terms of the constitution itself is not legally enforceable. So oh, it is. <laughs> uh, you can make it legally enforceable, but by and large, it's really one where you, what we've seen is that you want to really articulate the family values, because I think that's one very crucial part about why is it that family businesses have a legacy generation after generation. And one of the common threads that we've always heard is that it's the family values that has really made that possible. So what we do see in many constitutions today is a fairly clear articulation of the values. So not really so much into the legalese, but mm. really more in terms of just what is the spirit of the family. So that's something that we've seen. Malavi, from your experience? So I, I'm very, very bullish on family governance charters. I think it's absolutely excellent for families to have a governance charter. I, uh, I usually define it to people by saying it's like the articles of association for a family. You know, it tells you all the do's and don'ts. Uh, we've helped a couple of families draft their family governance charter and we normally start with a legacy. Because I think over a period of time, people forget where their roots were. And I think it's also like Samya mentioned, a great document to re sort of reiterate the values of a family. And that sort of really, uh, you know, stands out more in a family business because they're sort of they stand out for what right. they believe There's in the family legacy, and the value system. Values. And what people are doing now, uh, and there are a lot of examples. I mean, I'm sure, uh, you know, Rishabh sees the, the ones who actually land up in trouble. But there are a lot of people, for example, the GMR family. I mean, I'm very happy to take that name. They have a family governance charter that they abide by. And uh, that sort of helped them ensure that a lot of people from the family and the business without, you know, ever anybody hearing of any dispute out in the public space. And I think that's, that's what is making a lot of people set up those governance charters. See, if people want to fight, they're anyway going to find a reason to fight. But in the normal course, if there's clarity for people in terms of what are their roles, what are their responsibilities, 
if there are differences how do you sort them out quite often in families because there's a lot of emotion involved uh, people don't even know how to have a dialogue with somebody and say that they're not happy about something but if you can create that platform and you know the best thing and i often say this to people is when you go and tell somebody what you're doing is not right it's a you and me conversation but when you tell somebody what you're doing is not as per our family governance right, charter right, right. it's not a you and that me has conversation a, that has a greater and impact it's so much yeah. easier to have that conversation right you know there, there's lots more we need to touch upon this topic uh, uh, Soumya, we spoke about this uh, earlier, you know, and you said, and you told me that Ashwin, for many years, you usually had the CFOs or the finance heads of uh, of most family businesses who used to look at both the family business as well as the wealth, right? Then you, then then we then then we sort of chatted up chatted up about how there's a clear distinction now. There are separate teams looking at the family business business, and there are separate teams looking at uh, the uh, the family wealth. So therefore, there's a clear-cut differentiation of roles. Uh, throw some light on how that trend has uh, evolved. So that trend actually has come because you've been setting up family offices. Because the family office in some way is representing the family to be the custodian of that wealth. So specifically when you look at investments, earlier we used to see that the um, corporate organization, their CFOs, those finance teams would really look after all the investments for that family. But as families have liquidity events, as they have money that comes into their personal names, they then recognize that the way in which that wealth has to be managed is very different from a business because you are in some sense trying to make sure that you're preserving that wealth for future generations. So your outlook in terms of how the investments are made as well is very different. It's not short term in terms of one year or two years or five years. It is 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. The entire mind shift is then very different. So it means then that you need two very different sets of investment professionals really looking at this because it's like uh, it's, it's like saying that one is very patient capital and one is where you really do need to have an eye on liquidity if you ever need it. Right. Quick question before we move on to a few other aspects. Sure, Richard, I think go ahead. I completely agree with what um, Soumya is saying. I think if you look at the non-financial aspects of family offices today, we are seeing a whole new ecosystem of professionals really come into, come into that space and I'm sure many of the families here who have family offices would want somebody who's not just somebody who's on the compliance and financial side, but somebody who can help kind of bridge the gap on conflict management in the family, who can help resolve differences, and somebody who maybe comes from a learning and development uh, background as well. We are seeing now the demand for somebody who's, for example, worked in consulting, somebody who sort of worked in the academic side, especially from a family business uh, or of teaching perspective, somebody who's kind of worked in large MNCs who comes from, let's say, a CFO background who kind of handles risk compliance strategy etc so I think the kind of skill set we are seeing coming into the more sophisticated larger family offices today is actually very uh, very slick not just a compliance person but actually somebody who can help bridge the gap between the family and the business. So it's become more institutionalized? Thousand percent. Right. Pallavi uh, you know you've worked uh, with the advisory world you've also been associated with the conglomerate in the past uh, what are some of the structures that are popular nowadays or in vogue with family offices? That's a tough one. So, you know, family office is not necessarily a entity. You know, usually you'll find for most, last, most large families, it's an umbrella of entities. It'll have a trust, it'll have an LLP, depending on what you want to do. But what we're increasingly finding is that, you know, the, the need for a family office is actually because of people wanting to create a private book of wealth away from their operating company. So, it'll be a lot of companies which are land owning, you're holding real estate in them, you're doing private investments uh, in the stock market. You're doing private investments in terms of investing in startups. So it's not really one structure that sort of fits everything. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, structures that are chosen for valid reasons, whether it's tax efficiency or the ability to do ODI. So for example, a lot of people want to do investments overseas. So you always need to badge an entity within your family office that's going to do those overseas investments. So. I would say it's, it's multiple entities with different focus uh, uh, that are being set up. But uh, a sort of common theme that we find across the companies who we worked with uh, to set up their family offices, they want to rationalize the number of entities. Right. People by legacy have had multiple entities. They don't want to complicate their lives because they definitely feel 
the children are not going to be able to handle so many entities you know coming to the topic of children the next question to you uh, swami and this is about gen x we have some of them here in the audience uh, more and more family offices are now also moving towards private market investments and uh, some of them are also thinking of themselves not just as indian family offices but global family offices is it perhaps because of the aspirations of gen next what's your experience um, so the first in terms of private markets uh, the ecosystem for private markets in india has significantly improved in the last decade you've seen private equity you've seen venture which has come in um, and we ourselves at waterfield have seen um, client books move from about when i first started the company at about 1% of their portfolios in private markets to now close to about 12% which they take both through fund exposures as well as direct investments the interesting thing about private market investments is really the fact that you are diversifying in terms of your investment out of public markets so in the one that's the reason why they look at private markets also because the returns on private markets if you get it right mm -hmm. and if you get the exit then technically you can get returns which are superior to what you may get in public markets so there's a debate out there every time i meet a family saying why should i put money into private markets when i can get very good returns in public markets but having said that the reason why you do look at private markets is because there are certain themes in investments so if you were to look at let's say newer things which are happening in healthcare if you look at robotics if you look at autonomous vehicles if you look at plant based um, you know um, nutrition nutrition these yeah. are all areas which do you have um, companies in india which are specifically what you can buy into in public markets chances are no so in that sense you do need to have a little bit of exposure there if you want to take some exposure to the newer emerging investment themes the other reason what we see in family businesses why they like private markets is because they don't want to necessarily be blindsided by a newbie that's come into their area so when you are tracking or making investments into private markets let's say you are a pharma company you want to know what's happening in health tech you may find that it's an ancillary business that you may want to buy somewhere down the line so you want to start seeing some of those quite early on so that you are not then uh, you know kind of exposed to somebody right. coming and really moving your cheese right. so that's one of the reasons why we see private market investments increasing and of course uh, around the next gen um i do feel that from a global lens the opportunity set in terms of investment opportunities is much wider outside of india sure. in india it is still a very very restricted set that's also one of the reasons most families look at having a family office set up outside of india as well because just the exposure to the kind of opportunities whether it's in sustainability whether it's in impact these are not as as prevalent or coming into mainstream investments as they should right um, point taken Right. So you know, since I cover deals for a living, I have to slip this question in, and uh, I know we're coming to the end of this panel. Quick, thirty seconds, Rishab. Uh, so, are the Premji Invests, the Manipal family offices, the Ratan Tata family offices, really giving a run for the money as far as M&A scenario is concerned? When it com when you compare them to some of the uh, you know heavyweight uh, private equity suitors, quick question, a quick answer. We are running out of time. Thirty seconds. Uh, even less than that i would say definitely giving a run for the money they can sign same large amount of checks they can move faster they get to the same network effects that a large kind of private equity player will have they look better on your cap table as well so if you're having a choice between let's say a large a bulge bracket private equity or a family office take the family office money all right you heard rishab shroff over there on that optimistic note ladies and gentlemen i must come to the end of this engrossing panel rishab somia as well as palavi thank you so much for sharing your thoughts Hope you got some key takeaways from them. Thank you so much.